Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Nadav Samet. I'm an uh, engineering manager in a startup called uh, Tubular Labs, and I'm also the author of a library called Scala PB, which makes it fun and easy to use protocol buffers in Scala. So in case you didn't know, protocol buffers is a technology developed by Google that allows distributed systems to exchange messages in a, an efficient uh, binary format. I developed Scala PB because I wanted to have an idiomatic way to use protocol buffers in Scala. I started this project about four years ago, and it's been growing in popularity ever since then. One of the things I really like in coming to conferences like this one is that I get to meet uh, actual users of, of, the, of my project, and this is one of the more rewarding things that, that happen when you do open source. So you actually see that the people that you're working with are real and they actually exist. So uh, my story is that about six months ago, um, a user uh, tells me that they want to use Scala PB, but without giving it any protocol buffers, and asks me if it's possible to do it. Now, the entire point of Scala PB is that it's a tool that takes protocol buffers and it generates case classes for them with the serialization and deserialization methods. So telling me that somebody wants to use Scala PB but without giving it any protocol buffers, it's like telling me that uh, they want to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich but without a peanut butter. So that sounded a little bit crazy to me. But then I kind of took a, a big breath and I calmed down and uh, thought about it. And I figured out that there is a actually an interesting problem to solve here. Basically what this user is saying, I don't want to write protocol buffers. I already have my case classes with my domain model. I would like you to infer the protocol buffer schema from my case classes and uh, from that generate serializers and deserializers for me. I just want to, I don't want to deal with protocol buffers. So as I was exploring this, um, uh, this user's problem and, and trying to figure out how to do, how to, how to do this, I learned a few interesting techniques about uh, dealing with the user data types, the case classes, in a, in a generic way. And the beauty of these techniques, which I want to show you today, is that they're not specific to Scala PB or to protocol buffers. They, they can be applied in any situation where, where you need to deal uh, with the data type that the user gives you, and you kind of want to go field by field, maybe serialize, maybe print, maybe do things like that. So what I'd like to ask from you is, uh, as we go through the, my path of exploring this, uh, try to think if this is relevant to anything that you're working on, because these techniques are really powerful. If you ma can master them, they can save you a lot of repetitive code, and you know, fewer code means fewer bugs, fewer errors, better life in general. So um, pay attention. So um, I briefly told you what protocol buffers are, but let's cover this in a bit more detail in case you, do, you haven't never seen them before. So protocol buffers is a language to describe data structure. It's a format to define messages. And it comes with a binary, specific binary format that is well understood, well documented, quite simple. And uh, there are code generators that already exist, the official one for Java, C++, and Python. And my library, Scala PB, adds uh, support for Scala. And the beauty of this system is that you can start with a, a protocol buffer and generate code in Java and another one for C++ and Python. And different teams in your organization can just use the same protocol buffer as a reference. And uh, different languages, different platforms, different projects can just exchange messages. You, you serialize on one side, you deserialize in a different place, and you just get essentially the same data but in a different language. Here is an example of a, a very simple protocol buffer. We have a definition of a person message. And it has three fields, first name, which is a string, a last name, which is another string, and age, which is an integer. And you notice that every field is followed by a tag number. It's a running number, this one, two, three, at the right side. And these are used when you serialize the message. Uh, we actually encode the, uh, in a binary format the, the, that number. This is unlike JSON when we encode the, the field name, the, the key. And this results in a, um, in a more efficient uh, a binary format, but it also allows us to rename messages because the number is a part of the, of, the, of the encoding. So if a message gets renamed, you can still work with things you already persisted because it's just about the number. And once you have this, uh, this protocol buffer defined, you can use the POTOC command line tool uh, to generate uh, serializers and deserializers in different languages, like G Java, Python, and C++. And if you are using SBT, there is an SBT plugin which I wrote that lets you generate for those languages as well, uh, as well as Scala. 
Um, so on the left side, you'll see the protocol buffer. And on the right side, you see like a simplified version of the code that gets generated. You'll see a case class that uh, basically has a field that corresponds to every field in the protocol buffer. And there is a method there called two byte array that would take the, the instance and they return an array of byte uh, in a binary format, uh, in the protocol buffer binary format. In the companion object, there is an, the inverse method uh, called parse from, which takes an array of byte and gives us back the instance of a person we just realized. Here's how, you, how they, they work in practice. You instantiate a person object in Scala. You call two byte array. You get back an array of bytes. I call two vector just so it uh, renders more nicely. Um, but you get a bunch of, of numbers that represents the message. And you can go also in the opposite direction. You start from the array of bytes. You pass it to parse from. And you get back the original instance you've had. That's everything you need to know about protocol buffers for this talk. So, and this is probably mostly what, what there is to it. So remember the guy that wanted to use a Scala PB but without writing any protocol buffers? So let's first understand why would anybody want to do that. There are a few reasons. So some people have an allergic reaction to code generation. Every time they code generation, they, they feel that they, they can't deal with it. They don't like this step that comes before you compile that suddenly additional source files appear. I understand that. I a little bit disagree, but I understand it. And um, another reason for having protocol buffers is that when you have multiple teams working in different languages, different code bases, and they want to share some, some, some interface, some, sp some spec. But sometimes you just have Scala code, and everything is transient, and you don't need all these uh, features that come with protocol buffers. And this interoperability is just not a concern that you have in your project. And uh, finally, uh, when you generate code, you don't have a lot of control about what methods go, go inside, what it extends. So if you start with your own case classes, you can just do whatever you want. And the, the aspect of serialization and deserialization is just like outside of that case class. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to let the user define their own case class this way. They're just going to say case class, define the fields they want. Uh, maybe they add the methods they want. And then they want to instantiate it. And now we need to give them a way to serialize their protocol buffers. So we need to give them a way to call two byte array. But this doesn't compile right now, right? Because this is just a case class. There's no two byte array method on it. And this is our problem to solve. So a common idiom in Scala in situations like this is to introduce a, a the type class pattern. So the idea would be to define a, a trait called message serializer that takes a type parameter t. And t would be the, the thing that we want to serialize, the person in our example. And it will have a two byte array method inside it that would take an instance and return an array of bytes. And another idiom uh, that you'd see with, with type classes is the apply method inside the companion object that acts as a sort of a constructor. Uh, but instead of really building a new object, it's, it runs an implicit search and it returns back the instance that it finds. So this is enabling the syntax that you're seeing on the, on the first line in the second window, where we just write message serializer of a person. It actually calls apply and starts the implicit search. Assuming we are done and we're, we have a message serializer for any type t, we can just use it to serialize the, the array of bytes. So how, how can we go about doing those message serializers for type t for any user provided data type? How we go generically about this problem? So it turns out that the two byte array is normally implemented in terms of uh, two lower level methods. What you really need to do is to find the size of the message, like how many bytes it's going to be. Once you know that, you allocate an array of bytes on that size. Then you wrap it up in something called coded output stream, which uh, basically it's a, it's a class that just knows how to write the primitive fields into the array of bytes. And then the actual work happens in the write to method that um, that, has a, that takes the output stream and, and the message and writes the message into the output stream. And eventually, at the end, you return the array of bytes. So basically, all the interesting stuff is happening in the write to method. And they we're going, going to focus uh, on that one. Serialized size is similar, but easier to implement. So we're just going to, from now on, just look at how we're going to implement this write to method that takes an instance and write it to the output stream. So, the first way to do it is basically not doing it at all. So this is the copying out method that says, this is a manual definition. You, you, if you want to have your own message serializer for your classes, you're just going to have to write it yourself. 
And uh, basically, this is uh, like the Bart Simpson uh, punishment uh, thing. Uh, and we're basically telling the user, here is what you need to do to serialize a person. Write your own implicit personal person serializer. Uh, you're going to have a write to method inside it. And then you go field by field and uh, write it manually it, into the output stream. So output.write string for the first name, another one for the last name, and write in 32 for the age. And what do we think about it? This is basically, we're expecting our users to go like, for each of their case classes and do it. So this is quite boring. It's uh, tedious. It's error prone. It's not fun. But we have to say this, so we're going to move on. This is motivating us to automate this. So the first thing that comes to mind uh, is runtime reflection. And here we see a literal picture of runtime reflection. And, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and basically, with runtime reflection, we are, um, we are using information that's available to our program at runtime. Uh, we can basically ask, uh, in runtime, we're given a class object. What, met what, what uh, fields do we have inside? Can we give you the, the values of them? We can ask what the types of these values are and use that to serialize the object. So runtime reflection ob uh, code tends to be very verbose, so I kind of summarized it here. But what you see is that we call a type of T for that type. We get some object that contains all the, the runtime information, that, uh, that the information that we have at runtime for type T. We go through the members one by one, and for each one of them, we check the type. If it's a string, we call write string. If it's an int, we call write int. And if it's none of the types that we planned in advance, what we're going to do? We have two options. We can just drop it on the floor and ignore it, right? Or we can throw an exception. Or, uh, you know, nothing that is, that is really appealing here. It's, it sounds a bit bad to me. Because like we're in an environment like, you know, in Scala, there's a strong type system. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of tools that we have. We don't need to bring those problems, wait with them to runtime. We can find those problems at compile time. We know everything about our, our case classes when we compile. So that shouldn't happen. So, so let's review the pros and cons of this approach. So on the good side, we made progress from the Bart Simpson approach, right? So this is not manual anymore. We, have a, we wrote a code that basically can deal with the most case classes. As long as we know what types we have and it's a contained problem, we, we're done. And it's, we have just one case, one uh, serializer that can deal with all the types. So uh, th this is on the good side. On the done side, like we said, error discovered at runtime. If there is a, a field of type we didn't accept, expect, like a UUID or a daytime, this is just going to blow up at, uh, at runtime. The other problem with random reflection is that if you actually try it out, it, it's really slow. It's uh, so slow that we're just going to move on to the, to the next method, which I call generic derivation, which is called generic derivation. So this is finally where we get to the cool stuff. And uh, to me, this is one of the most uh, interesting programming techniques that I learned about recently. And this is, uh, this is uh, basically combining three advanced concepts in, in, a, in a way uh, to manipulate the compiler uh, to actually do things it wasn't designed for. So this is awesome. Um, the three things are H lists, uh, shapeless generic, and the uh, inductive implicit search. And if you haven't heard about these concepts before, just don't worry, because uh, you're going to become an expert on all the three of them and generic derivation in just four minutes from now. So uh, bear with me. So let's start with H lists. In general, the, the lists that come with the Scala standard library are, are designed to be homogeneous. They're, you're supposed to put things in them of the same type. So if you do 1, 2, 3, nil, you're getting the, uh, the type inferencer, inferencer will correctly tell you that you have a list of integers. But if you go crazy and do 42, false, foo, uh, put the things of different type, the compiler will basically infer the, the least common denominator, which is any. And, uh, and this is good, but a little bit sad, because we lost all the information that we had about the individual types that we had inside our lists. So this is where HList enters. And uh, they come from a library called Shapeless. And this is basically called a heter heter heterogeneous linked list. And by importing Shapeless, you can write something like this. And you'll notice at the end of the list, we have HNIL instead of NIL, which is the empty element or the last element of a, of a heterogeneous list. And when you run that and you assign this to things list, the type inferencer or IntelliJ, whatever you're using, will tell you 
that uh, you have uh, an instance of a int colon colon boolean colon colon string colon colon h nil. So the compiler actually knows what you have in every index in the list. And as a consequence of that, it actually knows the, the length of the list. So this is really cool. We don't lose type information now. And this is how you can use something like this. This is just a very simple example of how to use it. You can create a type alias called hl and uh, assign it to some type like this. And then you can define a function that takes an instance of this type. And then you call my function and pass a specific list to it. And it's only going to compile if the list instance that you're passing has the right types in the right place. Otherwise, it just doesn't compile. The next thing I want to show you, which is the second advanced concept out of the, out of the three, is uh, the generic type class. And so a generic T comes from shapeless as well. And it's a type class that knows how to convert from a type, like any type that the user gives you, to a, its generic representation. So, so let's unpack this. Let's say that uh, we have a person gen. Uh, we, we, have a, we want to have a generic for a person. So we instantiate it like this. And the type inferencer will tell you that what we got is a person gen of type generic person. And it has a nested type inside that's called wrapper, which is the representation of a person, which is a string string int h nil. Anybody knows why this is the generic representation of a person? Exactly. So what I heard is that uh, there is basically, we have a, for a person, we have a first name, which is a string, a last name, which is a string, and an age that is an integer. So you can basically represent every person case class with this with list of this type. And if you have a list of this type, you can go back to the case class. It's essentially the same thing. So you can do something like this. You can do person gen.2 and give it an instance of a person, John Smith 37, and you'll get an H list with John Smith 37. And it's very type, so we know it's, a, it's an H list of string string int. And you can go also go in the opposite direction. Uh, we can do person gen dot form and pass an H list that represents Justin Bieber, which is my favorite person on earth. And uh, then it would just give us back uh, an actual Justin Bieber uh, out of the H list. Uh, this is the formal de definition of a generic. So it has the nested representation type inside it. And it has uh, two methods, to and from. To would take an instance and give you the generic representation. And from would go the other way around. It will start from the, from the generic representation and will, will reconstruct your, your, your type. And inside the companion object, there is something called aux, which is auxiliary, auxiliary. And it takes two type parameters, t and r. And it's, assigned, it's defined to be a generic of type t with a representation type r. So this is letting us capture both the type and the representation type in a single definition. And it's going to be very useful when we, we want to pass this thing around. So it, you'll see it in a bit. Last ingredient is the inductive implicit search. So a lot of people know what implicit search is. But I think that not a lot of people realize that when the Scala compiler is doing implicit search, it's actually starting a recursive process. So let's say that you have a function that's called uh, uh, this function that, that takes an x uh, integer and an implicit a of type a. And you call it like this. You call func of 17. Now the compiler has a, has a mission in life. It needs to find somehow uh, this a to, to give it to you when, when you call this function. So it starts the implicit search. It goes all to the usual places. And uh, it finds this make a. But this make a needs an implicit b to, to, uh, to be manufactured. So now the compiler has a new mission in life. It needs to find a, a, a way to get a b. So it starts an implicit search for b. And it might find make b that needs a c. And then it might find this make c that returns a c. And then it's done because this make c doesn't need anything. So the compiler is now happy. It found a way to give me an a by chaining calls with a make a, make b, make c. And every time you, you write func of 17, the code that actually gets emitted by the compiler is, is, this, uh, is the longer version that you see on the side. So basically, by using implicit search, we can get the compiler. We can send it on a mission to, to use those rules for us and, and find a way to, create, to give us what we want. So we're going to manipulate the compiler to build type classes for us for, for whatever we want to serialize. So before we do that, I just want to introduce another type class called field serializer that takes a type parameter h. So field serializer is just a type class to serialize the, the primitives I have, the strings, the integers. 
Uh, it has a single serialized method that takes the output stream and a tag number. This is the running number for my fields. And a single value of type H that we want to get serialized. So I can define this way an in serializer that uh, takes an integer and writes it to the output stream. But just all it does is calling the right method on the output stream. And I can similarly define the string serializer, which uh, calls right string. And notice that I tag those uh, implicit uh, methods with uh, an uh, I tag them with the implicit keyword. So those are going to be found uh, at the right, like when, when we compile and we require a field serializer of string, the compiler is going to find them. OK, so let's figure out how to create a message serializer of type T. The new idea in gen generic derivation is that we are going to reduce the problem into um, basically two, fa two uh, phases. We're going to get a generic that's going to convert our type, the user type, from T to some H list R, to some generic representation. And if we can uh, create a message serializer for the H list, for the generic representation, then we are done. We're basically, for every type that we get, we convert it to an H list, then we serialize the H list, we're done. So our new problem now, the reduced problem, is to create message serializers just for H list. This is our new problem. So how do we encode using implicit functions what I just said? This is what it looks like. It's not very pretty, but, uh, but this is uh, basically the rule. We, get a, we write an implicit function that returns the message serializer of t, which is what we want. How do we create a message serializer of t? We need to give it two inputs, two implicit inputs, a generic that converts from t to an r, and a message serializer for an r. So if we can get those two implicits when we compile, we can just compose them. We can convert, uh, we can call generic dot two of t. So we get the, the, the user provided data type. We convert it to an H list uh, of type R. And then we call the message serializer of type R to, get to, to serialize it. And this is it. So our new problem is how to serialize H lists in general. This is how we take any user data type, convert it to an H list, and serialize. Now the problem is how do we serialize H lists. So um, in case of a person, it would look like this. A message serializer of a person will have a generic of a string, string int, remember first name, last name, age. And we need a message serializer for the H list. So how are we going to get the message serializer for the H list? So it, it turns out that serializing list is very easy. You just have two cases. The first case is serializing an empty list. Serializing an empty list is super easy, right? Because all you have to do is a write a write to function that does nothing, and you're done. So we just covered half the work for doing a serializing a H list. The second part is a serializing a non-empty list. What is a non-empty list? It has a head and a tail. What is in the head? It's just some primitive field, right? It's a string, it's an integer, it's just the first thing you have in your case class. Uh, so if we can get our hands on a field serializer for the head and a message serializer for the tail, for the rest of the list, we're done. We just serialize the head and then make this call to the, another message serializer for the tail, passing it the tail of the H list, and it's all serialized now. That's the beauty of induction, right? So you'll see in the second window the, the rule to create uh, the message serializer of a head followed by a tail. We have an implicit function that returns a message serializer of a head followed by a tail. And it gets a, in the inputs a field serializer for the head and a message serializer for the tail. And all it does is uh, calling them. Super simple. So we basically have just, we just defined three rules. One to convert a, any user case class to an to a H list. And two rules for H list, the nil case and the, and the, and the, and the non-empty case. And the, those three rules let the compiler do all of this for us when we compile. We basically request a message serializer of a person in our code. And the compiler starts to check all the implicits that are around. And it arrives to this tree. And uh, so it goes through the generic and then a message serializer for the H list. And then one step at a time, it shaves the head of the list until you, you, it ends up with an empty H list, which is our base case. And all of this together, we got the compiler to do quite a bit of work for us and give us the type class that does what we want. So in my view, this is like magic. This is, I mean, it's not magic because it's well understood, but this is quite awesome machinery that, that we have here at work. And uh, I think it's pretty impressive. So let's review this. What's good, what's bad? So uh, the improvement over reflection is that we get our errors at compile time. 
Uh, so for example, if you have uh, some field in, in, your, in, your, in your case class that is a UUID or something you didn't have a field serializer for, that implicit is not going to be found, you're going to get a compile time error. The approach is relatively fast. It's way faster than reflection, like two orders of magnitudes faster. And um, you can use custom serializers. So as a user, because we're relying on implicit search, you can have your implicit field serializer uh, defined in, in the right place. And the implicit search is going to pick it up, and it's going to become part of this machinery. So it's very easy to customize it for your own type. Downsides. I love downsides. Um, unhelpful compiler errors. So the problem with what I just said is that if it's not going to find your field serializer, it's not going to tell you that it couldn't find your field serializer. It's just going to tell you, I cannot get a message serializer for a person. Implicit, ser um, implicit not found, but it's not going to tell you for, wh for what field at the bottom of the tree it failed on. So that can be quite annoying to deal with. Um, there are ways to get the compiler to give you more verbose errors, but then basically the compiler tells you everything it had for breakfast. And it, it's kind of a little bit hard to deal with. Uh, the code that, uh, that gets generated this way is slower than the generated code that Scala PB already has. And it's a bit tough to deal code that's been optimized for four years now. Uh, but uh, uh, th I think that this can be improved on. The culprit of, of the slowness from, from the research I did was the construction of the age list, basically the allocation construction, and also the boxing that was going on of the, all the primitive fields uh, in the process. And finally, I showed you how to do encoding, and it works really well. But uh, the case of decoding is unclear. In the protocol buffer world, uh, the bytes can, the fields can come in any order when you get a binary representation. And it's a bit unclear how to construct an age list when things efficiently, when things just come in the order that you don't expect them. So uh, this, there's a little bit of unclarity there. So given all of that, I said, like, how can I improve? I really like this. And how, how can I improve this uh, to solve the problems that we see here? So I read how generic is implemented inside Shapeless. And turns out it's a, it's a macro. And that took me to the world of understanding uh, Scala macros. So Scala macros, like you see in the picture, uh, have this reputation of being a, like a black magic, like supernatural uh, evil power that's only reserved for a, a small group of Scala gurus that know what they're doing. And so I spent a few weeks with them and uh, a lot of time on Stack Overflow. And I can tell you that this is partly true. Uh, but to be honest, joking aside, it's, it's, more, it's more accessible than what I imagined. There's a lot of stuff on Stack Overflow. You can read source code that does it. Uh, I, I, found it I found it more approachable than, than what I thought when, when I started. So what I want to do next is, is give you kind of the, the gist of what, it like, what it's like to, to write a, a macro, show you that it's not that bad. But there are a few things that you should, be, uh, you know, should notice or worried about when, when you write a Scala macro. So every, every Scala macro starts with this. You, you define, it's, a, it's called the implicit uh, macros. You write an implicit function that returns the type that you actually want to get. And the body of that method has the word macro, followed by a, some function name, which is basically the, where the macro is implemented. And then you define this method. In, in this case, we call it gen impl, which is the genera it's where the, the implementation is. And it takes a a type parameter t and an implicit weak type tag that gives us at compile time all the information that we need to, uh, to know about the type t. And it returns a tree. This tree is basically abstract, abstract syntax tree in the, for, for, the, for Scala. And that tree is just going to get injected during compile time at the call site where this macro is invoked. Uh, and uh, the current implementation of the macro is three question marks. So when you actually, if you run this macro right now, it's going to throw an exception inside the compiler at compile time. So, so don't do it like, so don't do this. This is quite dangerous. But uh, we're actually going to implement it in, in a minute. And um, you might think that um, creating those trees in, that basically represent Scala code is, is hard, but turns out it's actually easy using a technique called the quasi quotes, which is the block of red text that you see right now. And basically, you put Q, and you put double quotes, and then you can write Scala code. And what actually ends up happening is that that Scala code that you have inside the, qu the quotes is converted to the, exactly the tree that you need to return. So it's super easy. And what uh, we have in, those, uh, in the red text is that we define a class with some uh, name that we get from an outside variable. 
and it extend, extends the message serializer of the user's type. And it has a write to method that currently does nothing. And then we return an instance of this class. So if a user is going to write something like this, implicitly message serializer of a person, the macro is going to get invoked. And the code that gets returned, the tree that gets returned, is just going to be injected at the call side. So the outcome would be the third window, what you see in the third window. That, that, that's basically what macros do. So notice how we kind of went a, a full circle, right? We started with code generation and wanted to avoid it, but it was code generation before compile time. Now we're doing code generation during compile time. But this is better. So uh, our next step is basically implement that write to method that serializes uh, the, the, user, uh, the user type. So first, we need to get our hands on the field serializers, the, those uh, things that know how to serialize the individual fields. So turns out the, there is a method that's available to you when you write macros that's called infer implicit value, that you can give it the type that you want, and it will give you the impli implicit instance of, of, uh, of that type. Um, and basically, we're creating a, a sequence of assignment operations that assign those serializers into values that we're going to use later. Um, so basically, for every field that we have, we're going to have an implicit serializer defined. And we're creating a sequence of val something equals something statements. And we're also gonna, going to generate a, a sequence of function calls to call those serializers on values that we can extract from the case class. So we go field by field again. And we call the serializer.serialize, give it the output stream, and extract a value a dot m dot name basically we extract a value from each from for the field from the case class once we have that we have the implicit that we need we have the writers that write calls that we need we can just use the dot dot dollar syntax which basically explodes the the sequence of statements into the the, the right place like just string substitution but for lists and the, this is basically Everything you need to do to get, uh, to get this macro working. What happens in practice, you do like message serializer of a person. And this is the code that ends up uh, being generated by the macro. It will create the string serializer and the in serializer on the top, assign them to values. And then it's going to generate the serialize calls inside the write to method. And this is it. And it's actually working. So this is pretty cool. And that's, that's basically what you need to do to write a macro. Where problems start to happen is uh, when you have those cases where you have uh, self-references. So you have a message that references itself, and then the macro starts to go recursively inside itself, inside the compiler, and you have to somehow stop it. There are ways to do it. And I re really recommend that uh, you give a try to a library called Magnolia that tries to systematically deal with those problems and, and make your life easy when, you write, uh, when you're in situations like this. Let's review the approach uh, uh, or this approach. So uh, the macros are fast. They, are similar, they have similar speed to the generated code. And why? Because they end up generating code that's very similar to the original generated code that Scala PB has. You can use custom serializers, because we are relying on the implicit search and all the built-in Scala mechanisms. And you get better compiler errors. And the reason is that when you write a macro, you can detect all those like, conditions where the implicits are not found. And you can give any error or warning that you want in your own words. So, so you can have very precise and useful error messages. Downsides. Limited debugging tools. So the ideas of today, don't let users put breakpoints or just even, or not even see the code that gets generated by, by the macro. And this can be a bit annoying for users that want to understand what's going on. Uh, so that's, that basically, that's the only downside I have. But this is also true for like when you write a macro, you don't have a lot of tools to understand what's happening inside the compiler. So it was a little bit of a trial and error to do that. But generally, after dealing with this, I think that macros is the right solution for, I mean, it depends on the problem. For Scala PB, when the emphasis is on speed and flexibility, I think it's, it's a good use case. We do need to get to figure out how to solve a few problems and, and, the, and maybe create something useful that for everybody that writes a compiler, this type of macros. But I feel that this is the right approach in general. What I want to do now is, is show you uh, the performance benchmark I had when I compared the, all these approaches. So what you see here on the y-axis is time in nanoseconds. So everything we're do doing is uh, super fast. This is the time that it takes to serialize uh, one single message. 
And on the, on the x-axis is the size of the message. So obviously, bigger messages, messages with more fields, are slower to serialize than, uh, than smaller messages. And of course, this is done with uh, something like JMH, where we basically serialize millions of messages, and we warm up the JVM and get, you know, get, take care of all the usual problems on, on, with be benchmarks on the, on the JVM. The black line is the generated code. This is the baseline of what I had. Um, and then it's followed by the macros, which is really, really close. The overhead comes from the field serializers, which the generated code doesn't have to do. It just calls exactly what it needs. It doesn't need to go through this abstraction at all. Uh, the red line is the generic derivation. Uh, and like I said, this is the, the overhead there, there comes from the H list and the boxing and unboxing. And any guess what, where reflection is? It's in the next graph because it, didn't, it couldn't get into this one. We have to zoom out two orders of magnitude. Here is reflection. It is still pretty fast, but we're talking now microseconds, not nanoseconds. Okay? Um, but it's substantially slower. Um, so uh, this is basically what I wanted to show you today, uh, three interesting techniques to deal with user data types in a, in a generic way. So think about this when every time that you go and you have something and you go like field by field and doing something, one of these techniques can, can help you. So figure out, figure out you know, how to, you can use one of them to eliminate uh, this repetitive code and use these generic approaches to save time and money and bugs and, and have like happier life. So no matter what your peanut butter is, just find a way to, to, get, to get rid of it. Thank you. Yeah. I'll take questions now, and there's a mic over there. Oh, thank you. Hi. Uh, so you said uh, you didn't do anything about the deserialization part. Is there work you're planning to do, or is there any code that is there for deserialization? Yeah, yes. For this talk, I just wanted to focus on one aspect. But obviously, when this is going to become something that uh, I'd like to release, then it would have to take care of both directions. Otherwise, it's not going to be as useful. Yeah. Hey, thanks Hi. a lot for the talk. This is not really a question. I uh, just wanted to say thank you so much for your work. Scala PB is the foundation for Semantic DB. This is you know, the platform for tools and stuff that I was presented here yesterday. And you know, over the whole time we were using Scala PB, we didn't encounter any you know, weird exceptions or errors. I mean, this thing is super stable. And every time we needed uh, some functionality, for instance, Scala native support, since we cr needed to cross compile to Scala native, well, here you were, and you just hacked it in a couple of days. I was like, wow, how is this even possible? So thanks so much. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Hi. I have a question about version of uh, protobuf. Sure. So do you plan to infer some kind of version of objects to safely uh, throw an exception if you think this should not be deserialized? Yeah. So it's a great question. And this is basically the, what you're giving up when you're uh, moving away from a protocol buffer file where you can maintain uh, you know, the tag numbers and, and all of that. You're kind of throwing that away when you move to the case classes. And my thought there is to actually, uh, the default would be to go with the sequential tag numbers automatically. But then you have this problem. If a user removes a field somewhere in the middle and all the numbers start to kind of like fall backwards, then uh, things are just going to break. And it's very hard to detect it before you start parsing. Um, and even when you, when you are parsing, you might end up somehow parsing correctly, but something that, you know, but you get garbage data. Um, so my thinking is that if a, a users really have a concern, they'll have a way somehow to, to tell what is the tag number next to the field. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to be. Probably a, like an at annotation, but it might be some, you know, a, a tag type or something like that. That's going to be one of the ways to accomplish that. Yeah, I had the decode question, but when I heard that, I was thinking, one of the things with, with versioning that you could do with the PB is have each of these case class, classes use a trait, and in the trait put that meta version information mm -hmm. and maybe a list of the ordering if it's 
if it's non-standard and okay. assume unless it's explicitly said, then one, two, one is the first field, yeah. et cetera. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Any more questions? Cool, thank you.